Well, many thanks to our two distinguished panelists. Now we have about 15 minutes for some Q&A, so go ahead. I'm interested in the presence of privatization. How do you assess the performance of privatization, and I'm thinking in terms of military, in support of national security efforts? Does privatization now have an extended or executive privilege beyond constitutional accountability? Since I don't know anything about it, I'll take a shot at it. <laughs> uh, obviously, in the military area, part of the Rumsfeld strategy of downsizing the military is to contra was to contract out more things, hence Halliburton, and, and that's been going on since at least the Clinton administration. An awful lot of uh, the action in the Balkans was performed by the same kinds of folks. Yes, it definitely does affect accountability. When private security guards are guarding American visiting dignitaries or performing other quasi-military functions, their actions are not as easy to hold accountable as, as if they were actual military. And I think we've, we've experienced enough of that in Iraq particularly to, to have qualms about it. On the other hand, I don't see any real re reason to believe that we're going to upsize the military. <laughs> There's no money. Uh, the existing arrangements are probably going to have to continue for lack of an alternative, at least for a period of time. I, I, I simply can't see any, any other way around it. We are learning from that, as we probably should have before. This is, because privatization was a big part of Al Gore's reinventing government program. It was to be carried across the, the entire government, the idea being to create competition and so on. Especially in the military, there, there just isn't very much competition. There are a whole lot of sole source contractors because the large private companies that support military activities have developed specialization so that if you want a certain thing done, there aren't very many people you can go to, sometimes only one, so you're not getting the benefit of competition, and that, again, is a problem. I, I would like to go back to your area of expertise for just a second, and there are That'll a few good. of us out here who really do care. To and actually, this speaks to what Mr. Flanagan had to say, too, and this may be a bit esoteric, but the fight between the Office of Homeland Security and President Bush wanting to keep it close to home and demanding the money from Congress, and the concession, as I see it, to a Department of Homeland Security, I read from what you were saying, sort of him taking credit for it. I don't know if you intended that to be his legacy. Would you comment? Well, <clears throat> he certainly signed it. So in that sense, he put his rubber stamp on the act um, and on the Department of Homeland Security. It seems it, what I was trying to recognize in my talk is that there has been this pattern from Truman through uh, President Bush of trying to institutionalize their way out of problems by creating government departments. And I, um, I don't think there's any doubt that President Bush allowed that to happen with the Department of Homeland Security. Now at the same, or the, yeah, Homeland Security. Now at the same time. You do see equivalent institutions set up within the executive office to try to keep as much power as possible close to home for the president. Um, but. Yeah, I, I would only add that obviously Bush in, initially resisted the idea of a department. He was aware and his advisors were aware that when you put together a brand new department made up of elements from all over the government, there's an enormous learning curve, an enormous period of time it takes to try to integrate those people into a single entity that can work together. And that in the, in the existing crisis, that might not have been the best idea. Bush tried initially to do it simply with a coordinating office in the White House under Tom Ridge. But Ridge had no budget to speak of. He had no real authority. He was simply not able to bring the agencies involved in Homeland Security. And remember, we were talking about the FBI and the CIA, and people with major constituencies in Congress. He couldn't bring those people together, never mind defense intelligence and, and, and the rest. So ultimately, Bush sort of threw up his hands and acquiesced in what uh, particularly Joe Lieberman was recommending, which was a new department. 
and then it becomes that kind of solution. But I do think, yeah, in, in, a, in a way, he wanted very much not to do it, but ultimately couldn't figure out any other way to get something in place. And of course, the Department of Homeland Security has had a checkered history. Uh, it, it contains FEMA, which got administratively downgraded within the department from what it had been before and has uh, underperformed ever since. Yes, thank you both for those presentations. Professor Walcott, could you please elaborate as you go through the phases and stages? I, I was curious about the impact specifically of some of the neocons uh, on the administration. Uh, please elaborate. Well, the ne neocon is a, is a broad, broad term. Uh, it's not even entirely clear what it means. It used to mean disaffected former Democrats. Uh, David Brooks now says basically what it means is Jews, uh, which he can say because he's Jewish. Uh, where, where you usually hear the term neocon is, is associated with the plan to destabilize and reconstruct the Middle East by invading Iraq and converting it to a democracy which would then infect the other democracies around, kind of our version of the, the good domino theory, uh, which would ultimately have the effect of, actually the, the ultimate goal for many was the security of Israel because you can solve the Palestinian problem if you can change the governments in places like Iran and Syria. So I, then there was a lot of thinking about this and some writing and a lot of planning that was going on in the 1990s. So it wasn't something that happened in short-term response to the activities of September 11th. People who were a part of this movement, people like Paul Wolfowitz, for example, in the Defense Department, were importantly placed within the Bush administration. And when the opportunity came up to move toward these policy goals, they took it. There, there's, a, there's a theory of organizational decision making, sometimes known as the garbage can theory of decision making, I kind of like the term, which holds that the way organizations make decisions, that there's a whole world of solutions out there. That is, things people would like to see happen, but they aren't being employed because there is, at most times, no problem to which to attach them. And what organizational decision makers do is, when a problem arises, then you have this array of solutions, each with its advocates, its champions, and you find among those solutions something you can attach to the problem in a process that's fairly close to randomness. It seems to me that the neocons vision in the globe, at least, their, their, their vision of the Middle East, was one of those things that fortuitously happened to be there at a time when you needed something that made the Middle East intelligible to you because we'd just been attacked by Arab terrorists. And all of a sudden, it had a credibility and a plausibility. It was at the top of the agenda where it hadn't been before. Uh, this is not a conspiracy theory. I don't think conspiracies work because I don't think we're smart enough. Uh, this is a, a target of opportunity theory.